Thanks for waiting, everybody. Um, I'm Stefan Kadaki, and I, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Patrick Mathias, uh, MD, PhD, who is the Vice Chair of Clinical Operations of Laboratory Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and one of the leaders in driving uh, automated large-scale COVID-19 testing. And his uh, lab alone has done more than 500,000, is that right, Patrick, 500,000 tests? Yep, 600,000 um, yep. 600, tests, uh, uh, which is an enormous, in laboratory medicine, an enormous uh, scale up uh, from starting with nothing. And he is going to show you how he used R to help orchestrate this, this ginormous effort. Take it away, Patrick. Thank you, Stefan. Sorry for the delay, everyone. I switched computers, hopefully be okay, no technical issues. Um, so uh, yeah, I want to talk. spend this time talking about actually this is not a, a, a R-centric talk. This is really an open source centric talk. So we use a variety of open source tools uh, and, uh, and infrastructure to help us uh, expand the scope of our, our testing. And really in, in laboratory testing and laboratory medicine and kind of this pandemic state, our, um, you know, the, by increasing our capacity of, of testing, we're really increasing our, uh, our access to testing. There are severe limitations, as I think everyone's aware, uh, throughout the country, throughout the world with uh, providing uh, timely testing. And so uh, we've spent a lot of time and effort uh, using some of the infrastructure that we've actually developed over time to rapidly deploy applications that can help us um, fill some of the gaps that we see. Uh, and so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about kind of the general problem and solution. I'm not going to go into too much technical detail about any one solution. There's gonna, There's a lot of Python and AWS in this talk, but uh, I promise there there's some R that I will cover at the end. Really, R has been what help, has helped us uh, support the whole operation. But I think it's interesting to go through the various um, solutions. This is really a lot more of a kind of clinical informatics perspective on how to how to just make things work uh, when under uh, difficult circumstances. Uh, and so I can't give this talk without really acknowledging the folks in UW Virology. Uh, and so. Uh, Dr. Greninger and his team uh, really oversaw uh, one of the earliest COVID tests uh, in, in the country. And it's my strong opinion, and take a, it would take a lot of uh, strong argument to convince me that our UW Virology Laboratory was, is not the, was not the most prepared laboratory in the U.S. So as soon as the genomic sequences were, uh, were out uh, in the wild for SARS-CoV-2, they were on uh, test development. Uh, at the end of uh, January, where they're pretty close to a test, uh, to having a test available. And then they really spent the majority of February going back and forth with the FDA to try to get this test available and, and out there. Uh, and because of regulatory and other issues, we're, we're not able to, to push it out as early as we'd like. But uh, it's really their effort. Uh, and you know, folks like Greg Pepper, who's the manager, Dr. Keith Jerome, who, uh, who's the director of the overall virology laboratory, and uh, you know, what has grown to be a very large pre-analytical team and a team of medical laboratory scientists that have grown uh, our, our testing and really the, the role that IT, that lab, lab informatics has had in this is to help amplify their effort and help make sure that their effort is, is maximally utilized to get testing out there. Uh, and so, so just to kind of frame, you know, our perspective in, in the pandemic on, on the importance of testing, uh, we have our symptomatic high-risk populations. We have folks who are also asymptomatic, uh, and really the the goal is to identify as many folks who are who are carrying SARS-CoV-2, the virus, test uh, test you know as many populations as as we can reasonably given our supply constraints, and uh, identify those cases, isolate them, and then you know cascade this process of understanding who they've been in contact with and identify other folks who might be infected so that we can uh, you know, stop the spread and, and contain as much as possible. This is really the, the general framework that many countries have used to be successful in containing the virus. Um, so testing is not the only piece of this, uh, of this solution, but it is a critical piece of the solution. And 
as laboratorians, when we think about the total testing process, we kind of think about this uh, this schematic here. At least many of us think about this schematic here, which think uh, which people might be familiar with the brain to brain loop. And so the general idea is there is some uh, action from a patient, some issue with a patient. Physician works with them to, to figure out the problem, and that triggers a, a laboratory order. We have our kind of total testing process going through ordering. You have to collect a sample, make sure it's properly identified, transport that to the laboratory. Within the laboratory, we need to prepare that for uh, analysis, which includes a critical step of accessioning the, the, the sample into our lab information system, uh, analyze that, we report that, and then you know, whether it's a consultation, whether it's an actual conversation, or it's a test validation in which the laboratory has taken their understanding of, of the test and injected that into a, you know, what can be an automated report that goes out to the physician and in this day and age, also the patient. So this is this is kind of the general workflow that, that we work with in every day in laboratory medicine. And from uh, informatics, electronics standpoint, uh, we, we think about our laboratory information system, which really coordinates all those activities within the lab. Uh, in our case at UW Medicine, it's SunQuest. And then we are very often in 2020, we're now working with the electronic health record. And so at our organization, we run both Epic and CERN, it's a variety of other electronic health records. Uh, and the those are not involved, both of those sets of systems are not involved in every step in the process, but they, they're critical, they play critical roles at either end. And so um, typically the way that we move data from one system to another is through an, what we call an HL7 interface. Health level seven is a standard of, of data that we're moving around. Uh, and you know we'll receive result uh, orders into the lab and then we issue results back into the electronic health record. And that is, that, that's, kind of the ideal state within the laboratory where we get electronic orders, we send electronic results back. And that's where typically we wanna be. Um, but HL7 can be challenging in that it is, uh, these, the solutions between these production systems typically uh, require a lot of uh, expertise uh, and time investment to build these pipes between the systems. Uh, and so it's, HL7 is called a, a messaging standard, but it's not completely standardized to the, to the point that you can't just say, I'm going to build an interface from this system to this system, and I can just apply a standard and, and be done with it. Every institution has kind of their different flavors of how they implement uh, HL7. And in some cases, you know, that customization it was, is critical for some functionality. In other cases, it's just a result of kind of historically how they've implemented the standard. And so what we see in the um, kind of in the informatics space on a day to day dealing with, uh, with sending messages between systems is that building these these pipes of HL7 messages are, are typically a high overhead activity. Most of our HL7 interface projects take weeks to months and you know, we need to respond to the pandemic on a, on a shorter time period. So the default mechanism by which we receive orders is actually in 2020 is still a piece of paper. So we'll get a, a sample and a piece of paper. And so this is an example of our uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific requisition. Uh, and you know, this will be filled out uh, with a lot of information. Sometimes you can pre-populate some fields with, uh, with, uh, with data from a kind of PDF generation. Um, but very often there are still lots of written elements to this, uh, to this form. Uh, and there's this critical step on intake in the laboratory, which can be a bottleneck of getting the information from your piece of paper into your laboratory information system. Uh, and so our pre-analytical team uh, plays in a, a critical role in that. Uh, and that can be a rate limiting step if you don't have a huge pre-analytical staff. And so based off of data analysis, which on our end we do in R to understand uh, throughput, we, we know we have a general idea depending on different flavors of interface orders a one FTE can process you know, 250 to 450 orders per shift. And then for manual orders, it's much lower, somewhere between 50 and 150. So whenever possible, we wanna shift manual orders, those paper requisitions into an electronic process. And it's this is not just true for accessioning, we wanna think about that total testing process. We have a fixed number of people, fixed amount of uh, analytical equipment, uh, and so we want to think about what are our approaches to take every step of that total testing process and make it more efficient so that we can get more tests through. And even if we, uh, even if we can't 
uh, you know, we, we can't scale all of our analytical capacity. We want to do what we can to make sure that we can get results out in a timely manner. That contact tracing, you know, testing and tracing methodology relies on us being able to get results out quickly. So one of the, uh, so if we think about this total testing process, one of the areas where we've applied custom software is around ordering and that accessioning process. And so initially, early on in the, in the pandemic, we were working with uh, skilled nursing facilities who really identify that, you know, we identify that these, these skilled nursing facilities are a high, are an area of high morbidity and mortality from this virus. And so um, many of our local uh, SNF residents were not already registered EW medicine patients. And there's high overhead to kind of doing that on a, on a mass scale, on a, uh, on a population scale. Uh, so while we were developing uh, the, the kind of the physical infrastructure to go in and you know have these drop teams that uh, that, that we're going to go in and help screen the, these uh, locations, we uh, we came up against this issue of okay, how can we do this quickly with you know we have limited capacity to scale up our staffing. Uh, we don't want to deal with uh, paper requisitions, um, but we identify that many of these facilities, even if they don't have an electronic health record, they do have rosters available in a structured format. And so our kind of starting point for a lot of these pre-analytical uh, improvements where can we take a spreadsheet, get orders into our electronics, inf uh, into our laboratory information system uh, via a spreadsheet. Uh, and so just to briefly touch on some of the, the resources that were helpful in doing this, we, we have been investing in uh, expertise and time in developing uh, uh, Amazon Web Services resources. And so you know, have a business associates agreement in place can do uh, can work very securely within uh, AWS and have that hooked into our authentication, our organizational authentication methods. Um, so that was one key key enabler, and then another enabler was really uh, uh, our Doku stack, which is uh, kind of very, very briefly. It's just the the general principle is a platform as a service. So if you know, can we can you package all of the components that go around deploying a web app application in a way where you can focus really on the application and the application logic and kind of have a template for all of these other pieces that allows you to just focus on your application, have kind of a, a template that will allow you to, uh, to, to, uh, to deploy an app uh, quickly and then have that hooked into our authentication. So that's kind of our, our um, starting point for a lot of these solutions is really having this ability to, to spin up an app, you know, write the logic, and then deploy it uh, on AWS in a secure manner. So the, our kind of first round at, at using this type of solution uh, was, was to work with uh, Dr. Ong and his team in post-acute care, um, where we would schedule drop team visits, uh, get spreadsheets ahead of time, and then uh, we developed uh, what we call up file, so an upload application that would allow us to take a, a roster, uh, do data validation and understand you know, what data is missing, what's going to break if, if we try to send data to, um, to SunQuest and really take some of the place of what of the role that the electronic health record typically plays. Typically your electronic health record does a lot of data validation for you. And so when you send a transaction from that EHR to your LIS, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, about uh, uh, missing data or or data that's going uh, that that is not the right format for your fields in your in your lab information system, and so we uh, develop you know pretty lightweight app to to replace that data validation function uh, and then uh, have a workflow to get that through our interface engine generate a stream of HL seven messages based off that spreadsheet and then um, and then send that to SunQuest, uh, and so you know. This is just a quick look at what, what the app looks looks like. And, you know, very quick, you know, took like a day to, to develop this. And then we've been working on the logic for the validation since as we add additional uh, fields like insurance and things like that. So pretty simple and pretty um, pretty straightforward use case. Um, but I think the, the reality is uh, if you are working kind of with institutional IT teams that are stuck with either the electronic health record or the lab information system, there's not really this, this rapid solution to help um, glue those together in, in many organizations, at least not, not in our organization. And so this overall can help us reduce effort, time, and errors at the collection site. 
uh, reduce our effort in processing because we're not manually typing in information and it allows us to capture really that full information straight off of kind of a, a, the record from, from the facility. We deploy this not only for our skilled nursing facilities, this actually came into play, has come into play with, uh, with doing uh, screening in other settings. Like uh, we have a lot, a large number of uh, Alaskan uh, fishing boats uh, that, uh, that are based in Seattle. And so we've been able to deploy, rapidly deploy screening for these boats by, uh, by working through this, this mechanism to, to get folks uh, uh, orders in and screen them quickly. And so thus far we've been able to screen 38,000 people based off of uh, this roster upload uh, mechanism. When we take, when we were uh, thinking about this mechanism, we, we kind of thought that, well, that was a nice um, solution and, you know, that's, uh, we deploy that kind of end of story that, um, you know, we're proud of ourselves, but uh, that, that was kind of, we kind of thought that, okay, this is just going to be a production thing that we'll do and, uh, and that'll be it. Um, but actually, uh, within a couple weeks of deploying this and kind of using this widely, uh, the city of Seattle came to us. And, uh, and asked uh, whether we could help support uh, high throughput testing sites uh, for them. And we kind of had this big challenge of there was a federally supported testing site that was going to be going away in three weeks and we needed to have a, a replacement for that uh, really quickly. And so um, really we want high throughput testing, we want to capture all the data um, and then uh, minimize our laboratory staffing requirements. So we, again, avoid at all costs uh, large volumes of paper requisitions that we can't um, that we can't log in. We don't have the staff to log in. Uh, and so, in in light of these challenges, we quickly came up with a with a analogous solution to uh, to our spreadsheet solution uh, using a solve app. The solve application solve is a, uh, solve health is a um, company that uh, produces a uh, self-scheduling web app. And so I think one of the key requirements for the city was to make it as easy as possible for someone who needs a test to, to get a test. And part of that is, can you, you know, provide uh, an, uh, access or can you provide a, a channel for them to go on their phone, say, I, you know, I'm symptomatic, I need to um, schedule something. Uh, and Solve has, re has really played that role. And traditionally they were working with uh, physician help, physician offices uh, with kind of a lightweight front end to get people self-scheduled into EHR schedules. Um, but we found uh, with that assistance of the US digital response team uh, in kind of rapidly doing, and you know, we didn't do a full R RFP uh, on this time frame, but we kind of did a rapid evaluation and said, this is a good solution to, um, to help us get structured data that we can feed into this data validation and order pipeline. And so just to kind of walk you through what the process looks like, we have a very prominent city of Seattle COVID testing website. Uh, you can uh, go through and it gives you information on who's eligible for testing. Uh, and you click, you can click through that and then find one of these sites, uh, you know, whatever's uh, most convenient for you. You can go to that. You can um, go through this, uh, go through that front end and then you uh, end up uh, with the ability to schedule yourself in for a time. And then you uh, enter required information uh, through this application. Uh, and then, uh, you know, one of the um, lucky uh, things for uh, for the city of Seattle sites was we had a large number of these emissions testing uh, sites that were used. Uh, you know, they were they were frequently used until I think December thirty first. The regulations around emissions testing changed in Washington, so actually we have a large number of sites throughout the state that are uh, that that uh, that are laid out like this, but they they they're no longer doing emissions testing, and so this was kind of a perfect start to, uh, to setting up COVID testing sites. So we repurpose these sites and then uh, patients go through, uh, drive through. We have registration techs who are kind of doing some screening up front. You see the uh, gentleman here putting a, a sticky note on the car. And so there are different color sticky notes that uh, indicate the, the level of uh, completeness of the information that the patient has, has put into their solve record for the downstream registration tech to, to review uh, and then help make sure that we have complete contact information, insurance information, and things like that. Uh, and then there, the, uh, the Seattle Fire Department actually staffs the actual collection staff for this. And so, you know, how does that physical workflow tie into our electronic workflow? We have our samples uh, with barcodes. We scan those into a field uh, in the solve application 
And that mean that that payload can be carried across to Upfile we can do validation, uh, and then we um, send that to SunQuest. But importantly, we have a sample identifier that can, that actually follows the whole process uh, and generates that order, so that when the sample does uh, is after it's collected and transported to the lab, we can actually just scan that into our system and retrieve the order. And so that cuts out all of that uh, cuts out a huge amount of work of logging in paper requisitions. So so far with this system in place, we've uh, we've performed 150,000 uh, tests for, from the city of Seattle sites. Uh, the fourth site just opened up uh, yesterday, uh, and then we're also working with King County and uh, areas kind of uh, testing deserts down in uh, South King County to uh, take the same system and apply it to uh, underrepresented uh, populations in South King County uh, through the county as well. So those are a couple of, uh, of some of the variety of solutions that we've deployed for, um, for our pre-analytical phase of testing, getting samples in, into, the, into the lab. And again, you know, we have kind of disparate systems that, uh, that, aren't, uh, that, are, uh, you know, that are kind of fit for their purpose, but there's not really a great uh, simple way to tie them together in the way that we need. And you know, that's, that's where we use our custom software development to support that. And so you can actually think about within the laboratory, we can think about those processes in the same way. So we do have automated testing platforms in the, in the lab, um, but those have had severe supply constraints. And so uh, many labs are still using a variety of manual processes with, with instruments that are kind of tied together with, or not actually tied together very well with, uh, with uh, smooth data flows. Uh, and so uh, we, we kind of have almost a similar type of a, issue on the analytical side within the lab. Uh, and so, you know, let's take the same general solution of kind of these uh, locally developed apps as glue so that we can send uh, data back and forth between the systems and decrease uh, manual transcription and manual error. So, uh, you know, the dream uh, in the lab is you have this you know, beautiful automated line and you, you know, the, the samples come into the lab and they magically go on the line and, you know, there are all these robotics and these instruments take care of all the work and then, you know, it will uh, issue a result uh, and you have very little, uh, you know, it's a very low touch process, uh, ideally um, for high throughput laboratory testing. That's not the case in the molecular lab. Uh, and so this is, uh, you can see, um, these are one of the things that, that we need to think about is, you know, molecular labs in particular, you have to uh, be very much worried about contamination. Um, but for these respiratory samples in particular, you're dealing with samples that have swabs that can't go directly on an instrument. So there has to be some manual processes to transfer your media, uh, you know, what the liquid that your swab is, is in to an, another two and then go through a series of other instruments for example, the, the PCR, the thermocycler instruments here on, on the right. Um, that's really the, the reality for most molecular labs. There are probably some molecular labs out there that have uh, more automated uh, solutions, automated lines. Um, but in general, most molecular labs, again, are they're not doing, they're not typically doing testing at this scale. Uh, and so you have you have to kind of glue these these solutions together in terms of moving your data back and forth. And so just to, at a high level to, to think about what happens for a SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral test, you process, you transfer that to a tube, that those tubes have identifiers from the lab information system. So kind of up top is, is, is the physical workflow and then below is kind of the, the data workflow um, for, for these samples. So you're, um, you typically have to go from these, uh, these tubes, if you're not running an automated instrument, you have to go from these tubes that have the sample um, to a 96 well or a 384 well plate. Uh, and then, uh, so that's the, the plate prep preparation by a liquid handler if you're lucky to have a uh, automated liquid handler. Uh, and then you move that to an extractor. And so that's a uh, that's an instrument that's kind of purpose built for getting nucleic acid, which we're trying to detect out of these samples uh, so that you can increase your sensitivity. And then uh, you, you know from there, there's some preparation and then it goes on to this thermocycler, which is Kind of that, that PCR uh, process that many people are probably familiar with where you're cycling the temperature up and down and then you're exponentially amp amplifying the nucleic acid. Uh, prior to, to COVID, uh, many of the these pro many of the processes, particularly on the on the back end of this, 
were very manual. And so uh, one of the challenges that we identified early on were that to get the um, to get the samples assigned to the right wells in the software, uh, the staff were manually scanning in the the two or the labels on the containers uh, kind of sequentially. Uh, and they were, you know, they would have to do this at uh, in racks, and they were doing this like 92 at a time uh, to go onto the plate. So this is, if you think about taking that workflow, that might be manageable for um, for a few plates a day for a technologist. But when you have to multiply that to thousands, then you're you know, you're asking for some rep repetitive stress injury, and it's just not going to be sustainable physically for the staff. Uh, and so another issue that we identified early on was that the results transfer was, again, when you're working at smaller volumes, you can't, you, you can manually review the output from, from the result, uh, from the thermal cycler. Uh, and they were kind of have a manual workflow of just putting a ruler behind under each um, result and then manually transcribing that to the laboratory information system, uh, which again, not ideal, uh, would have been something that would have been nice to know about prior to the, to the pandemic, uh, but you know was manageable with, with pre uh, prior volumes. When you're scaling up to do thousands a day, that's just, that's just not sustainable. And so those are a couple of the issues that we identified early on analytically that we wanted to uh, address. Uh, and again, using the same kind of model of transformers and moving around data to um, to to uh, reformat things to get them in the appropriate format. So. As an example, we might have an XML file that's uh, output from our Hamilton liquid handler, uh, and we need to coerce that so that it is uh, so that it can go on to our uh, it can be uploaded to our PCR instrument so that it, the experimental layout is accurate and the right samples are mapped to the right well. So the important thing here is you just have to preserve that mapping of you know what's the well on the plate and what's the sample that went in that well, and so you know very. Pretty, um, pretty straightforward uh, kind of operations. Uh, you can hear, see here. Uh, this is a Python um, script in the application, and then we, you know, deploy this on our Docker stack. And it's really the operations. You take your output file, you drag and drop it on the web app, and then it produces the output that you need that you can you know, go through a review, and then you can download the files that you need to go onto the the instrument. Uh, so that's. That's just that that actually that addresses that that 92 you know, scanning 92 samples at a time uh, portion of the workflow, uh, and then to address the resulting piece of the workflow, again pretty straightforward challenge of of just transforming data. So you have data in a certain format that you see here on the very far uh, left, uh, and then you want to parse that in a way that uh, our data innovations, which is our middleware that is used to to um, to talk between the instruments. And the laboratory information system, uh, did, that solution actually has a uh, has a, a standard um, uh, format for uh, for flat files to basically send a flat file to data innovations and then file those results into the lab information system. So pretty straightforward um, set of operations. Um, but again, having you know a nice web app deployment uh, can help us take that that script and then uh, turn it into something that, that the technologists on the bench can interact with quickly uh, and get the output that they need and send it to the lab information system. And so if we think about this whole process, basically you know, pretty early on in the response, really I would say within the first week of the response, uh, we uh, made sure that this whole data flow was, was much more automated. Uh, and, and then you know that helped us really you know, when we were talking before, uh, early on in the pandemic, we were talking about what our capacity was. We were, we were thinking about 300 to 500 tests based off of all these manual processes. Uh, and then this really allowed us to scale up to 2,500 tests per day. Uh, you know, at least the capacity to do 2,500 tests per day uh, based off of uh, moving the data around and really taking out a lot of these manual processes. And, you know, how important was that the ability to scale for, for the response? So this is... Uh, just showing very early in the pandemic, this is uh, based off of publicly available data. Uh, this is showing uh, the percentage of testing performed by UW, uh, by the UW Virology Lab. Uh, first, uh, against, if you look at the blue line, that's uh, total testing in Washington, in the state of Washington. So at that point, we were, we, it was us in the state lab that was um, performing testing, uh, state public health lab. And then um, 
And then the red is the percentage of testing for the U.S. And so in the first couple of weeks, we were actually doing 25% of the testing for all of the U.S. Uh, initially. And again, that's kind of supports my contention that I think we were the, the best prepared lab in, in, in the U.S. And really was uh, it, it, having the IT support to help scale um, could help support our virology colleagues to, to do that efficiently. So I won't spend too much time on it, but what this has actually also enabled us to do very quickly is to is to pool samples. So if we think about that custom data flow and the, and the ability to transform data into various formats, we can take a pooling protocol, so taking our liquid handler, and instead of putting a single sample in a single well in the, in the micro well plate, we can put four samples in the micro well plate uh, and we have a mapping that we can export from the liquid handler that says, okay, you know, you can look here at the, uh, each line is a well, uh, and then you can see the sample ID that's associated with that. And so um, you can take that, in, that information and that mapping uh, and then generate, you know, what we need to go onto the, uh, onto the PCR instrument. And in this case, we just concatenate the, the individual samples to make it fully transparent that these are the four samples that are in this pool. Uh, we can load that into our uh, thermocycler. Uh, and then uh, once you have this, you know, those, those concatenated samples, uh, when you're ready to upload results to the LIS, it's a very simple operation to just break apart th this concatenation and then you can individually explode out each pool into its CIDs. Uh, and then, you know, for detected pools, we don't send anything to the lab information system. We have the, the logic built in that prevents us from releasing those results. Uh, but then the negative pools go to the lab information system and then we, we can produce a output for, uh, from this, this page that, uh, that they can print out and then go retrieve the samples and, and reflex those to, um, to the, uh, to the non-pooled platform. So using this overall solution, we actually pooling is now kind of our default. Uh, method for running samples uh, in uh, uh, for outpatients. So, you know, this ability to to do these transformations has been able to take us from you know basically to uh, up to quadruple our capacity using the existing laboratory developed test uh, methodology. So that's really thinking about the analytical side. Uh, I think another aspect of the uh, response that we've been able to support is is really getting results to patients. And so kind of in this day and age, um, not only are we communicating results from the laboratory to uh, to the provider, to the doctor, we're also providing, we're also uh, communicating that information to, uh, to patients, directly to patients, typically through EHR patient portals. Um, but in the settings that I've described so far, you'll, you know, a lot of those settings are not traditional UW medicine, traditional healthcare settings. And so we have this challenge of how we deliver those results to, uh, to patients who really need, we want the patients to know those results uh, even more quickly than our public health folks and, and our providers so they can, uh, so that they have either the peace of mind or they can take action uh, on those results. We also have a subset of healthcare employees whose data is not in the electronic health record. So we really want to be able to, um, to provide results uh, to folks. And our lab information system does not have a built-in patient portal. Um, patient portals do have some overhead uh, and you know, phone calls for every single result uh, are really, when you're testing at scale, are not practical. Uh, and so we, our solution was to rapidly develop a web application that, that really had the right lab data flow so that we could support Result retrieval and couple that with the, the physical workflow of collecting the samples. So our our uh, general solution was to kind of have a pair of codes uh, that travel along with the sample, and so we have a um, we basically have a, uh, a QR code, a 16-digit code uh, that we kind of we uh, produce both a 1D and a 2D barcode code based off of. So the 1D barcode can go on a laboratory requisition. The 2D barcode encodes uh, a link uh, that has the unique, you know, the, each of these codes is unique, the unique retrieval code uh, embedded within, uh, within that. So they can just scan the barcode and access their result. 
And so we, you know, we also have some other uh, physical details around how the labels are printed to help make, keep help keep things straight so that you 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 know split the the right pair. Um, but the the general uh, workflow for this is you have your laboratory requisition code. We develop we basically put a, a unique field in the lab information system to support scanning in this code. Uh, and so this you know this is part of our routine process for for accessioning samples in the, in the lab is to scan. 1D barcode, so we can scan those right into, the, into that field, uh, generate a, a file that contains both the results and the retrieval codes, uh, and then using our AWS uh, stack, we uh, we generate uh, objects for uh, S3 objects for each of those results. Uh, and the key is to you know something you have and something that you know. So in this case, we have uh, the the 2D barcode is the physical unique code, and then uh, the patient enters their date of birth. Uh, into the application to retrieve their result. So this is uh, what the kind of our lightweight portal looks like. Uh, you know, you'll go, you'll go immediately. Your retrieval code will immediately be auto-populated if you scan the QR code, uh, and then you enter your date of birth, and then you get uh, your result back. And we can also provide kind of that first level of guidance based off of the results for different populations of folks um, uh, to kind of click in and, and make sure that they they understand. Uh, what it means and what the next steps for them are. Uh, so that solution is a little bit more involved than some of the other kind of lighter weight uh, solutions, uh, app solutions that, that I described, um, but uh, and requires a significant amount of support for uh, printing and distribution. So we have to kind of control the, the printing and distribution because we need to ensure that each of the keys or each of those uh, QR codes is, is unique. So there really can only be one source of truth for those. Um, we obviously ha end up having to field uh, support, uh, have to field support calls based off of people who can't retrieve their results. Um, and then also, you know, this involves close partnership with our colleagues at the collection sites to uh, make sure that they understand how the workflow works and, and uh, how we uh, ensure that uh, every pair of QR codes goes to the right places. We can. You know, we uh, look at some of the data from this, uh, and uh, you know, there's some interesting trends in, in that. Uh, on median time, and some of this data is a little bit older, but the median time um, to first visit on the site from collection was about six to seven hours, uh, and then in general, the median time from when the result is actually available to when the patient has retrieved their result is around two to three hours uh, during kind of daytime. Uh, obviously, longer uh, for overnight. Uh, and, we don't have our. We didn't have uh, kind of the, the data from before July first uh, in easy, easily accessible uh, fashion. But since July first, more than one hundred thirty-five thousand results have been retrieved uh, with this system, and we generally have had limited uh, downtimes or other issues uh, using this uh, kind of deployment stack. So. Uh, so far, I've talked a lot about these custom applications that are mostly written in Python, but you know, I think the important uh, aspect of a lot of this response, is it's, it's really taken uh, some expertise and some, uh, some uh, development over time of, of working with these solutions and taking things that we've developed. You know, and honestly, in a lot of contexts, myself and the other informaticists are going to develop some of these solutions more in the context of research but then kind of repurpose them and rapidly deploy them for uh, lab operations. So um, I, I haven't talked a lot about R thus far. So the last part of this talk, I just want to talk about uh, really R uh, and you know, its role in supporting our operations. And so just for some context about, uh, about the volume of testing that we've been doing, our typical test volume for the UW Virology Laboratory was about 5,000 tests per month uh, prior to COVID. Uh, and currently, we're doing five to nine thousand tests per day, uh, and you know we've in the process of doing that, we've had to move to a twenty-four-seven operation. We've hired a large number of staff, both on the analytical and the, the pre-analytical side, um, but we've had to we basically have had to kind of adopt an agile mindset really from the start of this and make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and so, uh, I think. It's harder to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis if you if you can't if you don't understand what's actually what's fundamentally happening with the flow of samples through your lab, uh, and how you're delivering on turnaround times, and you know how what kind of impact you're you're having on the response. So, um, 
And R has really been critical to driving our dashboarding and our visual reporting. And, and despite having a lot of expertise throughout many of our staff in Python, uh, kind of our go-to for whenever we're going to ask a question uh, analytically is, is R. For some context about what our infrastructure looks like, so I've mentioned SunQuest before. That's really it's not completely the center of our universe on, on the lab side, but it's really an important data source for us. And so this is just kind of shows you the flows of data into um, some of our uh, uh, reporting and analytics infrastructure uh, that we've developed over time. And so uh, SunQuest is our lab information system. Underlying SunQuest is a cache, uh, 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 cache database which is uh, the company that supports that as in, uh, InterSystems. Uh, and then we have these other data sources that we coordinate a series of uh, daily extracts, uh, kind of a traditional you know, ETL, extract, transform, load type of um, uh, workflow uh, to our database server. So we run a Postgres uh, database. Uh, and then we written, again, some pretty lightweight uh, command line functions within our, our warehouse package it allows us to um, to uh, import, uh, you know, basically run some uh, imports and schedule things, uh, set up the database schema and things like that. Um, and then on the kind of receiving end of all that data are uh, our uh, Python. We have some use of, of Tableau, but you're really our go-to um, for all things re reporting in terms of visualization is R. Over time, we've kind of built a uh, workflow using uh, Docker and GitLab, really not unlike what you can uh, what you can get in place with RStudio Connect. I think a lot some of our work on this um, predated uh, RStudio Connect, or at least our uh, awareness of, of that solution. Um, but we've kind of built a, a solution that is uh, that provides multi language support uh, and really containerizes um, kind of individual reports. Uh, and, and then you can supply it with a configuration that, uh, that not only includes you know, some metadata, like the name of the report, to post on our reporting website, but also who's allowed access based off of our, um, our permissioning and our groups that are available within, uh, within some other infrastructure that we, we've built. So um, you know, this is a, kind of has a, that nice workflow of you can work within Git. And so we use a GitLab instance. Uh, you know, do some uh, create some branches, prototype things, and then when you uh, when you merge things to, to master, that can uh, trigger the automated um, machinery so that the uh, so that your report on the website gets updated. And we found this this works. Uh, this is like a perfect match with uh, with Flex dashboard dashboards. You can quickly kind of spin out a, a Flex dashboard uh, and then deploy it, you know, within minutes, uh, and then just kind of set it and forget it. And you know, so far, we've um, produced. We have 20 reports. We have m many more uh, reports than that. But we have 20 COVID-19 specific reports. And I think I've been involved in the development of most of those. In general, our turnaround time for requesters is, is one to two days after kind of figuring out the design, going back and forth, uh, and then publishing. So I'm going to jump out of the presentation real fast, and I've um, see if I can. Hopefully you can see uh, my screen. So I've taken some select uh, selections from our uh, operations dashboard. You know, this is not the full dashboard. But this has some information uh, that we review on a, a daily basis in terms of our uh, operations. So you can see here this. You know, we're very uh, we're very focused on providing great turnaround times. Uh, we want to make sure we support that contact tracing process. So you can see our overall statistics, our median overall turnaround time uh, for yesterday, percentage of samples resulted within 24 hours, percentage of samples within 48 hours. You know, we want, to move, we want this number to be as close to 100% uh, as possible. And then um, this is our, these are our overall turnaround times uh, by date. So this is, I think, in addition to Flex Dashboard, another key component is just extensive use of Plotly. I mean, this, Using Plotly makes it so easy to just take a GG plot and turn it into an interactive plot, uh, really just an extra line of code. So we use that extensively. And then, um, you know, this is just showing fifth percentile in the green line, median, and 95th percentile turnaround times. And 
this is the, the overall picture is helpful, but what's you know most more important for us is we tier our samples based off of you know with medical input input from clients and so forth um, in terms of criticality. So we our tier one samples we want to try to deliver the the best turnaround time uh, for, uh, and then we have these other you know we have other categories um, based off of uh, you know inpatient, outpatient, uh, other different settings, uh, and then we can also drill down. Uh, and make sure and understand our uh, ED and inpatient uh, turnaround times. And this, this, these, to be clear, these are not actually our rapid tests. Our rapid tests, we can get out the door much more quickly. Those are on-site at the hospital. These are for samples that are sent to the central virology uh, laboratory. So, you know, we, we review these daily. And then, um, you know, when we see trends across these, we have, there, we have more specific views of this data based off of locations and, and clients. And so we'll look at that and then um, provide, we'll make adjustments when we see that, uh, that you know, someone's turnaround times will fall outside of their tier, uh, kind of operational decisions like that. Then we have, there's a selection of some um, processing data here that kind of shows the flow of samples through different sections of our, um, uh, uh, of our health system. Uh, and then kind of overall, sample flux to see, you know, how many we got in the door, how many were resulted. Uh, and then we have other, you know, detailed information about volumes of different tiers. Uh, and uh, this is this has been really helpful for staffing, particularly uh, early on and when we, we see changes. Uh, this represents uh, for each, you know, each of these vertical pa uh, sets of panels is a day. And then each of these on the X axis is the hour of the day. Uh, and we have different categories, so we can take a look at when our uh, when our larger shipments are coming, uh, when that changes, and then uh, make sure that we adjust staffing based off of the uh, the expected uh, number of samples coming in per shift. Um, so there's some more detailed drill down um, uh, information on uh, on kind of samples by hour of day and, uh, and FTE required uh, that are similar to this, but a, a little more detail. And we can also look at productivity uh, among the staff. And so we've uh, made some changes and set some targets for improving our ability to log uh, city of Seattle samples in particular. And so, you know, we were at steady state for, um, at, you know, one order per minute. Uh, and so this is daily just kind of calculating the average amount of time it takes to log in a sample. And, you know, we, we have a goal of uh, 1.2 orders per minute, which it looks like with some recent changes, we're getting closer to hitting. We can look at, you know, from a public health standpoint, look at population trends. And so uh, luckily the great news for Washington state is that numbers are kind of coming down across the board. So this just shows positivity rate by day uh, for Washington state. And then we have positivity rate by county um, and setting. So inpatient versus outpatient across our different counties. And you can see, you know, most counties here look, are looking really good in terms of uh, getting rates uh, down to lower percentages. Uh, and then I, I've kind of purposely obscured some information from this, but one of the key aspects to maintaining a pooling workflow is, is making sure that you don't have samples come through with too high rate of positivity. If, you, uh, if you're pooling for samples uh, to uh, a well and the positivity rate is 25%, then you know, chances are every single uh, well on your plate is going to be positive. And then you're just going to have to do a, a bunch of extra work to reflex all of those wells to the individual test. And so we use kind of a day by day view of our uh, weekly or, you know, past week positivity percentage. You can see I've taken out locations here, but you can see this is uh, or actually organized. Each row here is, is a specific ordering location. And so we can, based off of their positivity rate for the last week, we can basically exclude or include different locations in our sample flow from going to the pooling uh, workflow. Uh, and then I'll just mention quickly that in addition to, um, to monitoring kind of those more operational aspects, we also, supply chain is a significant issue with all of our laboratory testing. And so we have a flex dashboard that is basically driven by uh, a inventory spreadsheet process that, uh, that kind of we have staff who are monitoring inventory daily, making updates, and that really drives uh, another dashboard that's supply chain 
uh, that has some indicators about you know when we're starting to run low on a platform and th- we use this information to help us shift uh, testing from one platform to, a- to another uh, when needed. Um, lastly, I won't, I won't jump to the, uh, to the public d- dashboard, but yeah, the same Flex dashboard that, that we're looking at uh, drives our public dashboard, and so the link is here. Uh, and this kind of pro- just provides an overall summary of total testing numbers, positivity rates, um, the website, the bar graphs interactive, so you can look at, uh, at the numbers uh, here, and then you know, we, we provide yesterday's uh, statistics. Uh, and so based off kind of collectively, all of the things that we put in place to increase the, our efficiency of testing, we've tested more than half a million patients to date uh, and detected you know, more than 25,000 uh, infections. Uh, and uh, you know, are continuing to scale up our, um, our testing really on, based off of kind of daily iteration uh, that's driven by, by laboratory data. Uh, largely displayed by R. So to, to wrap up, um, I, I'll just share kind of a few of the, uh, at least the, the lessons that we have learned as R, uh, within our group. Um, I think we have rec- we knew this, we had recognition of this, um, but, uh, but you know, the pandemic has helped, has uh, kind of reinforced this in play, and this has played out. A lot of our conventional clinical information systems play an important role uh, in supporting access to testing. Um, but you know we have these kind of gaps, really in integration solutions, and so uh, develop, being able to develop some open source uh, software to, to support that, uh, on, or being able to develop on open source software solutions to support that has, uh, has helped us uh, do that data integration, uh, and we you know, we've been able to to develop some expertise in database infrastructure and, and AWS that has helped us fill some of these IT gaps and and really has driven a lot of our operational decisions. Uh, and I think I just want to emphasize that really this in increase, increasing laboratory capacity for any anyone who's working within lab medicine or adjacent to lab medicine, kind of that combination of increasing laboratory capacity plus partnering with our uh, with our colleagues outside the lab uh, can can help fuel uh, increased access to testing. I I need to acknowledge uh, kind of the three ends here, Noah. Nick and Nathan. So Noah is the director of uh, lab and pathology informatics, uh, and has been critical in uh, in really helping our group move forward on uh, with kind of these open source software capabilities. Nick Crum's our newest faculty member, who has been critical in the AWS, and Nathan Bright's our uh, data scientist, data engineer, who's kind of stepped in to do application development as well and support some of these solutions. I unfortunately didn't have a picture of Caitlin. She has been also critical to, to allowing us to scale our, our testing, and then other members from our lab med uh, IT team are uh, displayed there. And then the city of Seattle, I want to also call out, and uh, as well on the top right corner there, I can't say enough great things about uh, the UW Medicine Virology Laboratory. We've we've been able to, uh, you know, we we're just providing them support and helping them increase their efficiency, but they're really uh, doing all the work to, to get testing out there. And finally, you know, typically we talk about funding and support. In this case, uh, not supported by grants, but supported by our great leadership uh, in the department. Uh, Dr. Uh, so Jeff Baird, our uh, interim chair, uh, has really said, you know, we need to, uh, as a department, we, you know, I will support you in d- doing whatever you can to expand access to testing. Dr. Ramsey has said the same thing, said, you know, spend whatever you need to spend, do, get, uh, bring in as many staff as you need to, to support this response. and. Uh, uh, and then uh, Governor Inslee uh, has provided funding as well as uh, I'll call out specifically Steve, Steve Ballmer. She, he made a large donation to UW Medicine for testing specifically. Uh, and I do also want to thank all the donors. We've had lots of people who, um, who donated funds and, and food and, uh, and other goodies to UW Virology. So uh, their support is always appreciated. And I don't know that we have a lot of time, but I will I'd be happy to take any questions. We have we have two minutes. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing presentation. Um, the first question that was posted, most highly upvoted, is specifically what AWS services did you use? Were there any issues with HIPAA compliance? We'll have two yeah. minutes for for all questions, so maybe we can answer this one quickly. Uh, quickly, I'll say that we had a business associates agreement in place. 
And actually a lot of our time invested in AWS was focused on the security model and how we make sure that we plug in uh, our authentication, our identity and access management systems in a, uh, in a HIPAA compliant way. And then you know, every step of the way, we've also had to consult uh, with both Amazon and our uh, IT security team to make sure that you know, we're doing everything uh, above board and, and don't have any appliance risks. Uh, there's a variety of different um, solutions that we've used in terms of AWS solutions like uh, Redshift, uh, um, but I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know all the full list of them, but we basically, anything that Amazon provides that, that is kind of, uh, automates a large chunk of the deployment we, we try to utilize. And then just one more question. How much will what you have learned be applied to other kinds of lab testing, such as paper and hand scanning to modernize your workflows for other tests over the next five years? Yeah. So, uh, it, it, you know, our our typical kind of agility or response for other things are is is often much slower. I think I have no doubt that for um, for some of these uh, nursing facility and uh, employer t testing types of situations that we're, we'll continue to util utilize um, things like the roster upload to generate orders. Um, I, you know, I don't know how much that's in demand out, outside of the pandemic. Um, but you know what we're doing in parallel to a lot of these solutions is deploying kind of the more production traditional HL7 interfaces uh, alongside those. Uh, and so I think um, I've kind of changed my opinion. I thought you know there's no way we could go live with an HL7 with, without an HL7 interface for a solution like Solve. You know we had to build an HL7 interface for that. And based off of you know uh, based off of the, uh, what we've done. With this, uh, I think this it's actually more valuable in some scenarios uh, to to get something out there quickly that you you have to have dedicated staff and support. I mean, that's one thing that can't be underrated. Whenever you deploy these custom solutions, you have to have the right staffing level to to support them if they're being used in production workflows. And I think my opinion has changed a little bit. And I think I'm planning to do more staffing around custom um, software and custom, custom development uh, in the longer term than I was originally thinking about prior to the pandemic. Um, so I, I don't know. I can't say that you know, all these solutions are going to be used to facilitate um, all, all laboratory testing. And certainly for our PCR workflows, we're going to deploy that automated. Uh, I mean, we're working on deploying that automated uh, data transfers, so, uh, those solutions across other areas of the lab. Once we're a little bit, uh, you know, we'll spend more time on that when we're less focused on the COVID pandemic. Great, and that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Uh, so thanks again, uh, Patrick, and uh, thanks for a fantastic presentation. Thank you.